Hello, everyone. You are all muted, which is awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Hi, Helen. Um, welcome. Welcome to this really crazy, inspiring. Your life is never going to be the same after never. today. Never. <sighs> so Karen is here. Um, she is at the shop. I am at home. Um, so hello, Karen. I'm going to add you here. There's Karen. Okay, yes. I didn't know which camera to look at. Okay, yes. there we go. <laughs> so we have two different cameras that we are going to use uh, to show everyone all of what's going on. The process of art felt is really, um, it's really interesting. And showing it digitally yeah. is even more interesting. So we did this um, a couple hours ago. So we get to benefit from a little bit of practice. We had a rehearsal. Um, so anyway, Karin has one hour to finish a piece, a, like a little piece of felt. So I'm gonna go away, but I'm, I'm here. Um, if people have questions, if you could, instead of um, asking the questions with your mics, instead just type them into the chat. And when we have a moment, um, I will ask Karin your questions for you um, and we'll do our best to answer everyone's questions. I'll also be putting some links into the chat for some of the products that are really special to this process. So um, make sure if you are um, someone interested, you can uh, you can copy and paste those links in. Or if you signed up for our um, event and we sent you that email today, that reminder email, we're going to send you another email um, in another couple of days with um, information about the products that that Karin is using, some ideas about you know what you need to get to get going and all that stuff. So anyway, we will send you more stuff later. So Karen, hi. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Welcome and thank you for coming. Um, I'm actually thinking, you know, I mean, people could, I guess, just ask questions if they had them because it's a smaller group, but um, we'll keep it nice and contained and we'll let uh, Kyle monitor all the questions. So um, welcome. And uh, today I am going to give you a one hour tutorial on how to make a piece of felt using the art felt method. So first of all, what I'd like to um, go over is exactly what is felting. And um, felting is actually taking a fiber such as a roving or top, something like this, which is really nice and fluffy and is unspun yarn basically is what it is, removing all the air out of it. And when you remove all the air, look at that, it becomes really tiny and it's a solid mass. I mean, you can't even, you can't even see it in there. So however, when I open my hand up, it becomes light and fluffy again because it gets full of air again. So the felting method basically does the same thing that I'm doing with my hand, but it's manipulating those fibers so they latch onto each other and they keep the air out permanently. Now there's many different ways that you can actually felt. Um, one way that a lot of people know of is needle felting. And needle felting uses barbed needles like this here. Um, I'm really not so sure how you can see it on the screen, but I do try to come in close. But these barbed needles have little barbs on them and um, it's very much like a fishing hook. And so they all go in one direction. So once the barb goes through the felt or through the actual roving, what it's doing is, ow, I just poked myself. Um, it is actually um, getting the scales to click together and that eliminates the air. So when you're needle felting, you use this little barbed needle or you use multiple barbed needles and you just continuously stab your roving until there's no air remaining. And this is actually the best way to make little figurines and things like that. So that's one way to felt. Another way to felt is called wet felting. And wet felting is when you use the roving and you're going to use water and agitation to make those scales uh, click together and eliminate the air. And usually what you do is you lay out your piece. If you have a scarf or a shawl or something, you have to lay it out all at once. Um, and then you can roll it up and then you have to get it wet and you just keep rolling and rolling and rolling to get that piece agitated so that all the air gets removed. And then finally you end up with a piece of felt. And the third way is called fulling. And fulling is when you take a um, a yarn basically, and you knit it up and then you throw it in your washing machine and it ends up really small. And some of us may have accidentally fold a beautiful merino sweater or our spouse has 
done it for us by putting it in the washing machine and it was not a super wash and you, 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 and then you end up with a little Barbie size. So that's what fulling is. Now, for me to get an idea of how many of you have actually felt it before and what kind of knowledge you have, Kyle is going to put out a, um, a little questionnaire on your screen. And if we can just take you know one minute to answer that questionnaire, then I can get a better idea as to what kind of felting um, experience everybody has. And that will help me um, know exactly what kind of terminology I can use and what I need to explain a little bit better. So, oh, Kyle's already got it up there. Yeah, so I have it going on. Um, and you can also choose more than one option. The only one that you want that should be singular is I've never done this before. So if you've never right. done it before, choose that. But if you've yeah. tried wet felting and you have done needle felting, then choose both of those options. Yeah. Um, so we have 24 people here. So, mm -hmm. or well, 22 plus me and Karin mm -hmm. and her. And oh, and this time, like okay, so our last class, awesome. we had a lot more needle filters, and this time we have a lot more wet filters, I think. Yeah. Or wet so filters, oh, more people have full, yes. Fulling by accident is, I think, uh, yeah, quite a common thing. So um, very good. There's very few people, only a few, um, two out of everybody, two out of, yeah, so two people have never felt it before. So I'll, um, I'll go in a little bit of detail on some things, but I won't get too much detail going on on some of the basics. But now what I'm going to talk about is art felt. So we've talked about the three different types of felting, which was the wet felting, the needle felting, and the fulling. And what art felt does is it actually combines the needle felting, the wet felting, and the fulling, puts them all in one neat little package to create a method of felting that allows you to get things that are wafer thin or super thick, very precise with detail and all in a much easier and less time consuming format um, than using any of those other three methods. So the art felt is based on a paper and this is what the paper looks like. So a lot of people say that doesn't look like a paper that looks like a, an interfacing or something. And you know what, it really does. But Gerhard Schuppel is the person who developed this and you might be familiar with Gerhard Schuppel if you're a knitter or crocheter. He is the one who developed the um, Zauber ball. And so he has this yarn company but back in 2006. Uh, his girls who were going to Waldorf schools were doing a lot of wet felting and needle felting. And he said, there's got to be a better, quicker way to make felt than doing this other method. So he came up with this paper. And the key to this paper is that it dissolves in boiling water. It does not dissolve in regular water. Yes, there are plenty different uh, types of you know papers or interfacings or whatever that dissolve in a regular temperature water those will not work for this method because you need water to felt so you need the paper to hold your piece in place while it is felting so don't try any other types of paper it needs to be called art felt paper and then you know it's going to hold up so this is what it looks like. Um, there's no right or wrong side to it. Uh, you can write on it with pencil. You can write on it with Sharpie marker. Um, I don't suggest writing on it with ballpoint pen. Sometimes that ink runs where, whereas the Sharpie doesn't transfer and neither does pencil. Um, you can crinkle it up and uh, you can still use it. But whatever you do, do not iron it. If you iron it, you will probably ruin your iron because the high heat is going to get um, some of the paper might melt onto your iron. And that's the last thing we want to do is ruin a iron, whether it's a good iron or a not so good iron. So this is our paper. And there's a couple other things that you need for the art felt method. Besides paper, you need roving and roving or tops. So the difference between roving and tops um, generally is that tops are um, combed. The, the fibers have been combed and they're all going in one direction, which makes it very easy for you to draft. It's, this is called drafting, to draft fibers. See how they sort of pull apart because they're all going in one direction. When you have something like, this is now tops that is sort of like been pulled apart. When you have something that's uh, going in all multiple directions, you can't really draft all 
that nicely. I mean, you can, and drafting is actually a term that's used for spinning. So we sort of carried it over into the felting world, but you do want to be able to draft your fibers. Um, it works so much better. So whether you use roving or tops, I like using tops. Um, you need one that is animal based. So that means that uh, a protein fiber is something that comes from an alpaca or a sheep. Um, silk works beautifully. What you don't want, acrylics, nylons, even blends with acrylic and nylon on it are not so good. Um, you can use a cashmere blend, um, any kind of animal fiber, and you want to make sure it's not superwash. You don't ever want to use a superwash roving because trust me, you're going to be trying to felt it for hours and hours. And the reason it's superwash is to keep it from felting. So you will not have success. So make sure that it's not a superwash. Then you're going to need um, your barb needles. And I sort of went over what a barb needle was a little bit earlier. Um, you only need one, but uh, having a lot of them handy, you know, it, it just comes in handy. Uh, that's using the word twice, but you can also get these little type of things. This has three needles in it. Um, this one from Clover has a self little ceiling top so you can't actually poke yourself if you're not using it. And it has five needles in it. The only thing is, is these have a lot finer needles. The size and needle that um, we sell for the art felt method, although you can use any size, is a size 32, which has a pretty big barb on it. And it carries more wool through your paper. And you'll see what I'm talking about in just a minute. You're also going to need a tacking surface. So we use this material here. This is what we call our tacking board. And if this material looks familiar, it probably is. It's basically a packaging material. And um, prior to us getting this, we used all different kinds of things. But then one day we had something delivered and it had this in there and we decided to use it and it worked phenomenally well. So we found a company actually right down the road because we're in a very industrial area here um, that actually manufactures this. And so we now sell these tacking boards. Um, you can use your own packaging material that you have at home. The only thing that I recommend is don't ever use styrofoam. Styrofoam has a tendency for little pieces to get stuck in your felt. And once it's in there, it's in there. You really can't pick it out. Um, it's just there for life. Besides these boards, um, no matter how long you use them, uh, they really don't ever die. They're sort of like self-healing that each time you stick a needle in there, um, it, uh, it just heals the hole and they work very, very well. So I think it's a good investment. I mean, they're not very expensive at all to uh, get one of the official art felt tacking boards. And then you're going to need plastic and the plastic can be in the form of a plastic bag that you cut open, a garbage bag. If you ever get into doing huge pieces, I actually buy painter's plastic. Um, there's lots of different types of plastic that you can use. The only kind that I don't recommend is saran wrap. It seems to get a little wimpy and um, I don't like that when I'm doing my felting with the art felt method. Then you're going to need a clothes dryer. That's what you see right here. This is my little mini clothes dryer that has traveled with me throughout the United States. Um, it's probably been to about 20 states and uh, you need a clothes dryer. Don't worry too much about your clothes dryer getting ruined on the inside. Um, I used my clothes dryer at home for over 10 years, never had a single problem with anything getting ruined. And you'll see why it's because we contain everything um, that goes into the dryer. And then last but not least, you're going to need boiling water. Um, oh, and you need pantyhose. Pantyhose. Where's our pantyhose? You need a, a stocking like this here. Um, at least this comes in really handy and, and you will see why. You can also use, if you have old, um, uh, whatchamacallits, old, um, I can't even think it, fishnets. Well, not a lot of us have fishnets, but fishnets work really, really great. And if you have fishnets, well, you go girl. But um, fishnets are really great for this process. But these little trouser socks that you can buy, or if you have an old pair of tights or something, you can cut those open too. Those work great as well. And they help contain your piece during the felting process. So those are pretty much the items that you are going to need. Um, and we are going to go ahead and get started to see how to make a piece of felt. We start with this paper. And um, like I said, there's no right side, there is no wrong side. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my paper and I'm going to put it down on my tacking board and Kyle is gonna switch the cameras for us. 
so that you can see what we're doing. And I'm going to go over here. Hold on. And um, I have to get a few things off so I can see what I'm doing. So you guys can, I know you guys can see it well. There you go. The piece of paper that I have here today is approximately 10 inches by 10 inches. I love using 10 inches by 10 inches. For those of you who knit or crochet and you find swatching important, this is what I call for my swatching. This is my swatching. I can try all different techniques on a 10 inch by 10 inch. And the reason I do 10 inch by 10 inch is because then I can tell how much it has shrunk in the long run. So if I put in a piece that's 10 inches by 10 inches and it comes out six inches by six inches, I know I've had 40% shrinkage. And I also know that if I'm lay laying all my fibers in a certain direction and it comes back out and it's nine inches by six inches, then I also know that I've been laying all my fibers in one direction. And I'll explain that a little bit more as we go on. But therefore, when you're starting, I think anything you can make out of a 10 inch by 10 inch square is great. And we do have um, little things, you know, like here's a little eyeglass. Um, holder. This is a pretty fancy pattern, but this is a little eyeglass holder that was made out of a 10 inch by 10 inch square. So it's not like you're using them wastefully. You can also take a 10 inch square, um, you know, take four of them, put them together, make yourself a little um, a pillow or something once they're felted because they're smaller. I don't think you'd want a seven by seven inch pillow, um, but there's lots of fun things that you can do with your square. All right, we have our square down here. Oh, Kyle's really quick at moving that camera. So first thing we're going to do is we're going to choose a color. In this case, we're going to use orange today. And um, we are going to draft our roving and put it down on the paper. And when I'm talking about drafting, this keeps popping up. Sorry, then I can't see what I'm doing. Um, we pull, see these little light strands that we have here? We pull these out with our hand. And notice how it gives us a very, very um, light weight, light coat of roving on our actual um, paper, as you can see. And that's pretty even. Um, and I'm going to continue and I'm going to lay this one coat down all the way. And then I'm going to put some down here too. So we cover most of the paper. And if you're actually doing a 10 inch by 10 inch square as a swatch, you really do wanna make sure that you have your roving all the way to the edge. And there's lots of ways you can finish the edge and I'll show you those in a minute. So here we go. Um, I'm gonna leave this edge here. I wanna have a little couple of fringes. Hey so Karin, can, can yes. you show the eyeglass holder just down on that surface, like hold it to the second camera again? Mm -hmm. Super cute. Yep, and that's basically cute. like a 10 by 10 square that after it's been felted, it gets sewn up and. Yep. And done. actually it's not even sewn or up. Glued. This, glued. Yeah, this is actually done with a hot glue gun. Um, so for people who can't sew, <laughs> hot glue gun works really, really nicely with felt. Um, so, and then here's another little piece, and this is also a really bright piece. We're not gonna go crazy today, but um, this is actually a little iPhone case, but I don't think this was done by a 10 by 10. This is a little bit longer of a piece. Um, but they're both small pieces that are good to start with. So here you can tell now we have one coat um, of the roving that we have laid down and we've laid it down. Um, for me, it's vertically. Now I'm going to put on another coat and I want to lay it down horizontally. And the reason I do that is this is what's called crosshatching. And when you're crosshatching, um, think of your fibers. These are all your fibers. If they're all going one way, they have a hard time attaching to each other. Um, they can rub back and forth and they can get attached, but not real solid. Where if, if they go in this direction, right, they can get all tangled into each other and it just gives you a stronger piece. Um, and it also felts evenly if you uh, crosshatch. So I have, I'm getting to my little ends here. When I get to the ends, it's a little bit harder for me to, um, pull out little wisps, but I will do it anyways. Um, and then here's a little bit more. Just gonna, and if you notice, um, sometimes I, I go from one side to the other side. These wispies are really long. And so I try to have those, oops, face the inside and um, keep the rest of it, uh, the straight edge over here. So, 
there you go. Not exactly the most even job, but um, it's definitely going to work. So now I have two layers on my felt. I have one going um, horizontally and one going vertically. And next thing to do is to attach this onto the paper. And this is done with a tacking motion. I call it tacking. Think of it as popping a balloon. You're going to use your needle and you're going to pretend as if you were popping a balloon. And what you're going to do is simply go through your piece and go like this. And as I'm doing this, what's happening, I'll show you in a moment and you can see it, is my little barbs are pulling the actual roving through to the other side um, of the piece. So, or the other side of the paper. So let's see, when we get down here, I'm going to remove it from the board so you can see what I'm talking about. Um, I'm going to pull it up. And um, can you see all these little, um, actually, I think, Kyle, let's switch camera. I do believe this camera goes better for the close up. You can see all the little holes in there. Um, do you see all the little orange pieces coming out? That is actually what you're doing with that needle. So I poked it in, as long as it doesn't come out when it's upside down, you can actually start your design work. And if you just wanted a solid piece of felt, um, you wouldn't actually even need to um, do more. Uh, but, you know, we, we, we want to design. So what we're going to do today is we're going to put a little heart on here. And um, one thing to know about robing, I'm not, I'm not even sure if I just told you this or not. I think I did, that you have to hold it far apart in order for it to um, actually come apart. I did tell you that. I don't, you know, when you do two classes in a row, it's sort of like a weird feeling because you don't know. It's all sort of like deja vu. Um, but I'm going to just poke that in and then I'm going to get myself a little heart going here. And I choose a heart because it's easy. <laughs> um, and I'm just going to take this here. I'm going to hold that in with that needle. And then I'm going to tack this part in. And then I'm going to say, oh my God, that looks really, really messy. I don't like that. So it's okay if it hasn't been tacked in too thoroughly for you just to pull it out. And then you can just fix your mistake and you can make it look better. Um, second time around. So there we go. Um, and let's see. there we go. I like that better. So there I've got a basic heart, but I actually want to fill my heart in. So I'm going to take my fibers and at this point I can actually fold them a little bit like I just did there and tack once more. Tack these in. So at this point also, if I don't want to use a single needle, I could use the triple needle or I could use the five prong. Uh, that's this one here. And, um, and the five prong does a pretty good job when you have quite a few layers going on, as you can see. I'm going to fill in my entire heart because we wanna see how the thickness gets affected later. And um, I mean, this is not brain surgery. It's not that you have to be totally precise. Um, you just wanna make sure that you get it tacked in. Let me put a little more here. And here. And perhaps a little more in here. It's a little messy goosey. All right. So I've got that pretty well tacked in. But it's looking a little messy. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this single needle and I'm simply going to move some of these um, strands in because all the loose strands, they will felt into place exactly where they are. That is the uh, perk of having the paper is that you can have exact lines wherever you want them. Um, there we go. And that's not so clean, but let's see, there we go. 
And then if you, the cleaner your edges are now, the cleaner they will be when you um, actually finish your piece. Okay, so now we have that done. And um, this is still a little fluffy. I'm gonna, I'm gonna take this, I'm just gonna go a little bit through it um, just to uh, get it a little bit um, more put in so you can see your design. And this piece is actually going to be a little bit thin over here, and that's okay. We sort of want to have, um, well, maybe, maybe not so much. Let's put a little in. Um, we want to make sure that you can see different things that can go wrong with pieces and so on at the end when we're done with this piece. So there you go. Now we have that done. This would be ready to go off and felt. And, um, and if we did that, we would end up with a cute little felted heart, um, something uh, like this, which we did last night, and something like this, which we did earlier in the class. These are both still wet, by the way. Um, so we've got our little heart here. Now look at the edges. Okay, so we have a couple of different edges. By the way, look at how this, when I pull this off, see how it sort of peels? The fibers get stuck in here. And that is one of the reasons why we love these tack boards because it holds your piece in place while you are actually working on it, which is really nice. You don't have to hold it in, your, in place at all yourself. Now there's several different ways that you can actually go about your edges. You can just leave your edges. And um, actually, you know what? I think we're gonna leave some on this end. I'm actually gonna twist some because um, if I twist a few, we can get a couple of little, um, uh, eh, what are they called? Um, fringes on it, like that. Um, and yeah, just twist it a little bit. Now on this edge, I'm going to, uh, this one we're actually gonna take needle and we're gonna give it a nice smooth edge. And by a smooth edge, I just mean lining it up. And there's, there's a lot of tricks to make this easier. You can use a ruler and things like that. But we only have an hour today, so we can't learn all the tricks of the trade. We can just learn the basics. Now, if you look here on this edge, that edge is also a little wonky. So another way to finish an edge is to simply take your scissors and cut your edge like this. And I actually cut a little paper off and that's okay too. I set this aside. I can use that at a later date for something else. So then I have one smooth edge that was cut. I have another smooth edge that I actually turned over. I have a couple of wispies here and this side, well, this side's all over the place. Right? Can you see that? This side is all over the place. So we'll see what happens um, when we're complete with that. So now my piece is ready to felt. Ta-da! Um, let us get our felting materials or our, our wedding materials, um, I should say. Let's see here. Uh, hmm. I feel like I should be on a cooking show. I'm pulling all this stuff out. Um, all right, so what do we have here? Um, are we gonna, are we showing? Oh, there we go. Um, this here is actually the lid to a Tupperware that I'm using. And I've put a couple of small, you know, rags in it. And on those rags, I put water. And if you can see my hands all wet, um, this is, it's not soaking wet, but it is quite wet. And the reason I'm doing this is there's many different ways to get your piece wet, but this is one of the easiest um, this actually works really well with a long scarf too, believe it or not. Um, but for this little piece today, if I were at home, I would probably throw this into my kitchen sink and I have a really nice sprayer head on my uh, kitchen sink and I would probably just spray it a little bit, put the plastic on it and roll it, which you will see in a moment. But I'm not at home and I don't have that. So I'm going to be using this method. The next thing I need is remember how we were talking about plastic? This is where the plastic comes in. So you need a piece of plastic that is wider than your actual piece. So you want to make sure that all your robing is going to be covered on the edges. You also need it a few inches longer at the beginning. 
And then at the end, you probably need anywhere between, I don't know, eight and 36 or 40 inches if you're doing a really, really big piece. You know, I've done things that are 10 feet long. And when you do that, well, that's a whole nother ballgame. That's a whole nother class. But um, anyway, so you cut your plastic. This actually used to be a plastic bag that I just opened up and it works beautifully. Then what you need to do is get the top wet. So um, you can do this without getting the top wet, but if you can spray the top as well as having that water come from the bottom, it helps. This here is um, a beautiful, <laughs> a beautiful, I do love these things. Um, this is meant for pesticides. You can get it at Ace Hardware or something. And uh, they've cost $9.99. They haven't gone up in price, I don't think, since 2007, um, since I started buying them. But this little size is great because you can just pump just once and look how wonderfully that sprays. I mean, fabulous investment for the, uh, the $9. And as you can see, there's little beads of water. They, they take a little bit of time to actually get soaked in, but we're gonna force them in in a minute here. But we're first gonna start, we're gonna get this pretty wet and we're going to concentrate right here in the heart because our heart is a lot thicker than the rest of it. So we need to make sure that it is really wet. And now, also, whole... I wanna just point out, we, we mentioned it earlier, but um, on the last one, but that's just room temperature cold water. The boiling water comes later. This is just ah. room temperature water. Yes, good point, good point. Um, yes, just room temperature water. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to put the plastic over it so it has like an inch or two at the bottom and the rest of the long part there. And I'm going to press down. And as I press down, you're going to see how the piece changes. And now you can actually get a better idea of what the piece is going to look like when it's complete. But I want to make sure, and I don't wanna go like this, all right? That could actually make your fibers move. You want to press down from the top and just make sure it's thoroughly saturated. If it's not thoroughly saturated, and you could tell because you'd see a lot of air bubbles, then you would wanna pull your plastic back. And at this point, it should come off really easily and spray more. The other thing you don't ever want to do is when the roving is still a little bit like this, you don't want to take your wet fingers and um, touch it because it gets stuck on your fingers and you may pull something out of place and you don't want to do that. Um, it's not the end of the world, but uh, you know, if someone would have told me that way in the beginning, um, of course, no one told me anything because we didn't know how to use the paper, but there we go. It is all ready to roll. Now comes the fun part, and I'm going to roll this loosely. That means I don't want it too tight because I want this piece, when it goes into my dryer, I want it to get agitated. I want it to rub against itself. I want it to move. If it's too tightly wrapped, it's not gonna do that. So I'm gonna wrap it pretty loosely like this. And here, look at, you can see all the fibers on the backside. Um, and I'm not showing any air bubbles at all. It's very, very dry or very, very wet. If it were too dry, I'd just take out my bottle and I'd squirt it again. Now it is easy to get it to be too dry. You can never have it too wet ever. Even if it's pouring out water at the end, which is perfectly fine. And this one probably will be. Like if I hold this upside down, um, I don't know. Well, yep, there you go. You can see some water squirts out. I don't want to squirt too much water out because I want to keep the water in there. But now I have my piece in a nice little Tootsie Roll shape. And I'm going to use a pantyhose. And I'm going to slip my hand in the pantyhose. And I'm going to grab one end and pull this over the top. There we go. So now it's nice and secure in my pantyhose. And we have a little run there. And I'm going to actually use a slip knot because this way I can reuse my pantyhose. That makes it nice. The other thing you can use are um, hair bands or rubber bands or something like that to tie it as well. Um, and uh, it is ready to go in the dryer. Now, some people freak out and they're like, you can't put that in the dryer, it has plastic. Well, the thing is, is when this goes in the dryer, we are not putting it in there to dry. It's going to remain wet the whole time. If it doesn't remain wet, it is not Belting, then you need to get it wetter. It should, see how it's dripping here? I mean, it should be dripping when you um, are ready to put it in your dryer. There we go. So 
There we go. And I'm going to put it in here. Um, I have, and I still continue um, to put some of these, you know, roll ups in with a regular load of laundry, especially towels and jeans and things like that. I don't think I'd put it in with something like silk blouses. Or, and I know most people don't put silk blouses in their dryer, but I do. So, um, anyways, I have an extra rag in there. Most dryers have the little ledges on them. And if you just have one piece in there, because frequently if I'm not doing it with a little laundry, I wanna have lots of pieces in there, it can get stuck on the ledge. So you might wanna check it every once in a while to make sure that it didn't get stuck on the ledge and it's still going in circles. So I'm gonna, oops, my dryer's had its day. It has a big dent on the side too um, from traveling so much, but I have it in my dryer. I've got my power on and I'm gonna hit start. So what heat do you put it on? Um, that's a very good question. You don't necessarily need heat. Um, heat is nice to have. It does help speed up the process a little bit, but it is not necessary. It is the agitation and the, and the fact that the piece is wet that is actually felting. So you're, you're having your dryer do your hard work. If you were wet felting, you'd be going like this. If you were needle felting, you'd still be going like this. But now you have your piece in the dryer. So now you can go get yourself your glass of wine or whatever it is that you want to enjoy. And um, and you can sit tight. We are going to only sit tight for this piece. For Oh, did I say something? No, I was going to say, but before you get your wine, you have to set a timer. Oh, you yes. Have to make sure that the dryer is actually running. Yeah, do that beforehand. I have yes. this little timer here. Um, I got to turn it on again. And I'm going to start with 10 minutes. So Jeanette had a question. She said, uh, would wool dryer balls be helpful in the felting process? Yes. I think they'd be really good, actually. Yeah, they would because, um, and so are tennis balls, because what they do is they just, they hit the garment more and it gives it more agitation. But you need to, um, uh, you need to be careful with that. I usually go over that, you know, in more advanced classes and things like that. Um, because if you do it too quickly or you have too much pressure hitting the piece, it could move around and you don't want that too much either. Um, but on the next step, uh, when we put it in the dryer again, then it is extremely helpful. So yes, and you can actually, um, well, no, you can't make dryer balls with this method, but you can make uh, felt balls, believe it or not. Um, it's, it's a really unique process, but you can make hundreds of felt balls at a time with this process. And uh, you can make rainbow ones and, and all different kinds of things. So um, and the, that's- The dryer is running right now? The dryer is running right it's now. It's so quiet. Um, yes. Uh, so I would be curious to find out. So I know you have some of the things in, um, I saw all the step outs and stuff before, but the uh, the negative space, the ones where you don't yes. have to fill. Can you show us that? Because I think yep. it's I think it's really really cool. Yep. Um, so this is one of my favorite pieces with negative space, and by negative space we mean areas that don't have any roving. So this is um, a shawl, and as you can see, um, there's some negative space in there, and uh, this one is very very fine as well. This is done out of a pure merino. Um, I do have, uh, let me see, I have a heavier piece. Where did my, I don't see my hook anymore. Okay, we'll just put it down here. Um, here is a heavier piece that you can see this one's a lot thicker. It has a lot of negative space. Um, you can get really wacky and go 100% negative. Um, well, not 100%, but you can do a mesh, something like this really easily. Um, I don't know what you'd use the mesh for, but uh, somebody made this and thought it would be cool. I guess you could wear it um, around your neck if you wanted to. But the way negative space is made is there's several ways. Um, and I've got a couple of samples here. So this is the first one. This is your finished piece. And you can see the negative space in it. Um, and then the way we started that one was with a grid like this. And the reason we started with a grid is because if you look at this piece, if I didn't start it with a grid, I may have not attached these two pieces here. And the grid simply gives me an idea of how much attachment I need 
for the piece to stay together. Um, so I start working with my grid and I do a little more and, um, and then a little more. And then this is the finished piece before I would actually put it, um, get it wet, put it in the dryer. You can see there's the paper and wherever there is no roving on the paper in these areas, that is where you're going to end up with negative space in the long run. So another way that you can do negative space is um, if you actually have a piece and I've got a piece here that's ready to go in the dryer as well. You can see it's all you know put in there. And right here, we just cut out a hole. So you can actually cover your whole piece. You don't actually have to lay your, um, I'm sorry, I just caught myself saying actually again. People always make fun of me because I say actually too much. Um, you can put, you don't have to lay your roving around the hole. You can actually, you can. You, um, you can, in fact. <laughs> <laughs> you can, in fact, um, just cut holes. And that is what we do with um, like our holy scarves and so on. But sometimes um, it's actually nicer to cut the hole once it's felted a little bit. Um, because then you get a little bit of a cleaner cut of a hole, but it's um, it's just really easy. I mean, if I wanted to cut a little circle here, I mean, I could just go like this and um, cut myself a little circle. And then when I felt this, I'm gonna get a little circle in my piece. So you can do some of those beautiful pieces that are holy all over the place. You can strategically place holes. You can put holes at the end of a um, at the end of a scarf so that it looks pretty and it's decorative. I mean, there's lots of different ways to use um, holes. And then whenever you have roving that you cut out, um, I always save my paper and I save my roving in two separate places because the paper, well, I actually use it for paper mache. I got floozies in my mouth. Um, and that is when I'm making three-dimensional uh, projects out of the art felt paper. And roving, well, you know what? You can always use this for something. Um, you might need it even if you're needle felter. It's great to put on the inside of a project or something. So I never throw away my, my actual roving. Um, Another thing but, people, uh, I think, um, may not under realize is you could start with a pencil drawing. So if you have a... a image you want to lay out and have negative space, meaning I don't want to put roving in some of the spots. I want to have holes in my work. I can do a drawing. And then on top of the drawing, you can lay out a grid. So you were doing a grid that's really regular, right? Does it no. always have to be fairly regular or can it be no, really a support structure? You don't even <clears throat> really need a grid. The only thing that I found through teaching classes is that when we did pieces with a lot of negative space, that people had a tendency not to make attachments in areas. Mm -hmm. And then you would have a piece that would flop around all the time. So then I realized if you do some kind of a grid, um, yeah, you can absolutely draw on the paper. You can use a pencil, you can use a Sharpie marker. But what you need to remember is what you draw on the paper, if you're going to use a base, like we, the base was the orange that we put underneath the heart. If you're going to do a base, it's going to cover up your drawing, right? So um, that's not going to work. Mm. The only time you can work on top of it, if you look at the piece up here um, that says welcome on it, what we actually, actually, got the word actually in, um, what we actually did on this one was <laughs> we drew the letters on the paper backwards, mirror image. And then we tacked in the letters first, and then we put the other color on top of it. Can you draw and on that, what? Um, you can see. Can you can see through the paper? You can see through the paper. So can Why? you draw? So you can write the word the but right way. But you cannot. You can't use both sides of the paper at one time. Very but then well. flip it over. Yes, so and then when the you put something on tack, there, tack, tack, but then tack the letters. Yes and then put the background on it. So you don't have to actually write the word welcome backwards. You can write it forwards, flip no, the entire, can't. no, no okay. you, can't. you cannot, no, you That's can't, why I'm you not can teaching. try it. You can I try wanna, it, you're no. gonna go through a lot of work and you're gonna be very disappointed. Okay, no, yeah, it does don't not want disappointment. Nope. No, no, has to be in mirror image. So um, when it's facing you, when it's facing you. But what you can do is you can just write it on one side of the paper, flip the paper over and then you know, tack it in on that, you know, rewrite it so you can see it better. But you do have to do mirror image in order for it to um, 
right. to show up properly. And the only problem with doing this <clears throat> is that as you're tacking colors in, um, you can see on this piece right here, um, this has been around for so long that it almost looks like it's felted. But this here just has robing on it. It has orange on the bottom, and then it has teal on the top. And what happens is the teal on the top, that's what your top layer looks like when it's felted. But this is what the back layer looks like. All the little strands from the teal come through. So you can most definitely use that um, as a design element. However, when you're doing something like this, you sort of want to avoid your black lettering, which can be hard to do um, so that it doesn't come through. If we would have not paid attention, you would have had a lot of little marks um, in those black letters and they wouldn't have been a solid black. Now, if you end up with a couple of marks, you can always take a little bit of black afterwards and just felt on top of it if you want to. But I sort of like to do it right the first time and, and then I don't need to worry about um, covering things up. Uh, so- um, Ah, Martha is asking a really good question. Um, yes. Can you tell us how you get a Nuno effect with silk or gauze fabric? So a well, felted effect. Know, <laughs> yeah, it's funny. I just packed up a piece like that. Um, Nuno felting is totally different. And you know how he's talking about silk being attracted to wool? Um, when you put just a little bit of wool on a solid piece of silk, it just gets soaked right into it. The silk acts like a glue. And I love that aspect of it because um, that means, let me see here. I got some pieces over here. Um, it means you can actually, uh, actually again, um, this is a very, very fine piece of silk that we just laid right on top of a piece of uh, roving before we felted it and it felted right in. I mean, it is solidly felted in there. So Nuno felting sort of takes advantage. It takes a piece of silk, you put your roving where you want it and then the roving gets um, absorbed into the silk and then a lot of the silk is still showing. Um, you can do Nuno felting with the art felt paper. I'm not so sure if it is the um, best use of the paper. In general, Nuno felting is um, sort of an art felt of its own. And oh, I hear my, my, my buzzer. Okay, so we have a 10 minute time. Let's look at our paper and let's see. Oops, let's move this because it's going to be wet. Um, and let's see what we have. All right. Yeah. It didn't beep like that yesterday earlier. <laughs> I know. I don't have anything. It beeps now. Okay. So, oh, there we go. I'm going to take my knot out and I'm going to let it come out. And um, it is still wet. And here's my little fringes. They're not so great. Um, they got a little dry actually because they were sticking out of the plastic. Um, but here I'm going to unwrap it and you can see, and actually it's still dripping. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to squeeze a little water out. Um, but there you can see the actual felt, it, the felting process has begun. All right. So this is all smooth now. Um, I can't peel up the heart with my finger at all. <clears throat> and um, if I look at the back of my piece, I can see my paper and my paper is wrinkled. So if my paper is wrinkled, that means it has been felted. If I were to dissolve the paper at this point in time, I would have a solid piece of felt, but it wouldn't be very strong, it'd be pretty weak. So what I'm going to do, I want a stronger piece. So I'm going to grab a bag like this. I'm not going to re-roll this piece. I'm just going to throw this in the bag like this. And because I want it to stay wet, that's why I'm not gonna just throw it in my dryer. And I don't want, um, uh, I don't want the paper exposed in the dryer because if the paper is exposed in the dryer and you have a hot dryer, then you might get some stickiness in your dryer and you don't want that. So we're going to put this in and we're going to start it again. And this time we're going to do it for four minutes. So the timing that I am using um, is not the timing that you always have to use. Everybody has a different dryer. Every single piece is different. It depends on your roving. It depends on, you know, whether it's alpaca 
for a cashmere blend or if it has silk in it. It depends on how thick it is. And this is why swatching is great. If you're going to make yourself a beautiful scarf, um, swatching can be wonderful. Um, unless, you know, on a scarf, I guess you're really not that particular about certain things. But if you need to make something a specific size, swatching is great. And then time yourself so you know how long it always goes in. And, um, you know, my dryers work differently in one place than they do in another. So if I were teaching in Denver, um, which I did, my drying time was always longer. So I would do a piece the night before to make sure that I had the right time. And right now I'm gonna put in four minutes um, and then we're gonna take it out again in four minutes and it is going to be ready for us to dissolve the paper at that time. Um, are there any other questions? Why we've got about four minutes. Yeah, so uh, folks, if you have questions, you can post them in the chat. Like, um, what's your it's favorite, who's fun. your favorite employee or um, who, I don't know. <laughs> okay, um, well, but, it's okay. You know what? If there's no questions, I have plenty to talk about. I mean, I could talk for hours. Um, what this thing, method... uh, people did ask, I'm going to put you on the spot because I like the answer you gave about the question that someone said, is there any book or series of instructions about this out in the world? Is there a published book? Yeah, you just want to embarrass me. I do a little um... bit. I want you to, I want you to, make this book i think it's so cool yeah so I've actually betty wants to know book. i've written a book i just haven't done the photography for it i wrote the book about 10 years ago um and uh it's just sitting on the computer um or actually i do have a printed version but i need to uh, get some photography done for it and come out with the book because there are no books on this method it is such a um a little known method not a lot of people have the paper um, and uh, you know Gerhard Scheffel and, and I we used to um, felt all the time and as a matter of fact we taught classes in Europe and stuff and had a great time doing it um, but then Gerhard took up knitting again and um, he's been knitting ever since and and he just keeps knitting his sweaters and knitting his sweaters so um, I would have had hope that he was going to come out a book with a book because he's the one who actually developed this method and but then we, we could make together to we come could up take with um but since he made such he makes such amazing roving we could take his fiber art yeah. felt some well, fabric and then sew it together and make like a hoodie or add other like cross craft with other fabrics and make other things like there's so much you can do with this it, yeah, this here is a, this is a cute little shirt. It has art felt sleeves and then it has a knitted body and it's made with coordinating roving. So you can do a lot of different um, things, you know, whether you weave or um, knit or crochet, you can use felt for all different parts um, of your different garments. You can make cut and sew fabric um, and you can actually art felt on top of fabric which is uh, what you're seeing, for instance, over here. Um, if you look at this here, this is all fabric. And on the back side of that fabric is felt. And it's actually on the reverse down here because you see the felt here and you see the fabric on the bottom there. So this was actually a, actually again, um, <laughs> this, this should be one of, those, one of those games that people play and they always take a shot. Um, the, fringes that are here, they were actually part of the shawl and we just incorporated it into the pattern. So you have a couple of different materials here, um, you, but if you make cut and sew fabric, you can use your standard sewing patterns. The only thing is, is you got to sew it as if it were felt. You don't want to have seams on the inside of your piece. You want to do flat seams. Um, but that is what happens when um, you use fabric with it. And I didn't start my timer. I think um, it's been about four minutes. It's been okay. four minutes. Okay. So, yes. And I didn't even have wine. And um, so do turn on when you set your timer, <laughs> turn it on. It's a really good thing to do. Um, so let's take the piece out. I'm going to turn that on for a minute. And um, when I open it up, it looks a little scary um, because it has all now crumpled into this little piece. And I'm like, oh my God, but don't worry. 
that's the right thing. And I'm actually cutting my bag open this time because I don't feel like taking the knot out. So now when I take this out, once more, it's really dripping, it's still wet. I'm gonna move some of the water out there. But now when I take it out, you can see this is more of a solid piece of felt. Um, can you see that? Or not? Yes, yeah. Yep. Okay, so now we have our solid um, piece of felt and it actually looks like felt. Um, here you can see the backside. Um, you can see the little wrinkles, I hope. Yep. That is one way to always tell exactly um, how much your piece has felted. If your paper is super duper wrinkly, well, it's felted a lot. The other thing you should know is if you don't get all your paper off your piece in the first place, um, like here is a scarf and um, it still has paper on it. So all the paper was not removed the first time. Um, don't worry about it. Even after 10 years, you can still use boiling water and the paper dissolves. So if you ever find that you didn't totally dissolve it, you just go back and dissolve it. Um, really easy to do. So right now I have my water <clears throat> boiling. Um, what you want to do is, there's many different ways um, to, to get rid of the paper, but they all involve boiling water. So a small piece like this, once more, probably toss it in my kitchen sink, pour the boiling water right over it and watch the paper disappear and go down the drain. It is not toxic. It's not going to hurt the environment. Um, if I had a huge piece, I would probably put it in my bathtub. Um, for classes, I use a big broiler that you put turkeys in and I can actually fit, you know, 24 to 48 pieces in there. Um, to be dissolving the paper over time. So, but today I'm going to use these great gloves that um, <laughs> that Kyle gave me. And You're they welcome. Make, <laughs> they make me feel like a cartoon character. Um, so, and I hear my water is boiling. Now, the key to this truly is boiling water. Okay, I, I'm looking in the camera because I want you to understand this. If your water's not boiling, chances are your paper's not going to dissolve properly. So, I'm going to take my piece. And I'm going to put it in here. And do you want to go ahead and um, refocus on the other camera so people can see? There it is. Yay, there's our piece. <clears throat> um, and then let's move it so that we have the whole piece there. Now you can see the paper there, but see this piece? This piece is dry, all right? This piece um, I just did quickly last night. And see how this paper is dry? It doesn't come off but it is dry so you can see it better. And the reason I have this piece too is because I want you to see how quickly it dissolves when you have boiling water. Um, the so other thing um, is this, um, this paper is like food safe, it's kid safe, it's... Well, you don't wanna wrap your food in it and eat it, no. no but, but it's definitely kid safe and it's, and it's safe for the environment and all that other stuff. Yeah, yes. so you're not like pouring chemicals it's, down. It's, you know, it is no. like a plant-based. It's a starch. Yeah. It's starch is what it is, that's it. So when I see this piece here, I'm just gonna pour some over. There you go. Um, and uh, oh, I probably should have my glove on because it's pretty hot. You can see the steam coming up. But there you can see, look at where I poured the water over. I mean, the, the paper dissolved right away. And so I'm actually gonna pour it all over this piece in here. And I'm gonna finish this piece too, why not? Because I have it in my hand. Um, and oh my God, these gloves are great. I can pour They're very them. good, right? They yeah, were not expensive. These, for, these are awesome. Um, Those are from our dye lab, everyone. Oh, <laughs> so we, we have a dye lab in our shop, which okay. uh, one day you can all come hang out and dye yarn with us and dye fabric and we can do art felt. And so normally what I would do is after you um, use the boiling water to um, remove the starch, um, it can feel a little bit sticky, so then you want to rinse it for a little while. Um, and oops, I'm losing my scarf. So you would rinse it with cool water. Um, oops, let's get our other piece out. And um, cool water, warm water, it really doesn't matter. Just rinse it for a little bit so that you get all that, that sticky starch out, because that's all it is, is starch. And, um, and the boiling water activates that starch. Something's booked. <laughs> just wanted to say hi. 
<laughs> okay. And, you know, never mind if a little bit of um, color comes out of your pieces. That is almost always going to happen because most uh, robings and tops, they are not designed for boiling water. Okay. They're not designed for that kind of heat. And, uh, but you're still going to have a nice, relevant, beautiful piece. So you can see me stretching it. Um, that is because felt is extremely stretchable. And at this point in time, you can stretch it to a lot of different shapes if you want. Um, and there we go. We have our heart piece. Now, this was the edge that we turned over. You can see it's got a little bit um, thicker in some areas. This was the edge that I said was really thin. This was the edge I think that we cut. And, um, Oh, I think all my little uh, fringes got lost when I stuck it in the bag. I probably should mention that if you want fringes, you don't want to put it in the bag for the last um, four minutes like I did. That is just a method of um, for smaller pieces and ah, so on that works uh, really well. Faye has an awesome question. What size is it now? Oh, that's a really good question. Do you have um, a measuring tape? <laughs> I we don't can guesstimate. I mean, we have 10 million of them in the store. Um, I do not. Well, here we can, this is, um, this is a 10 by 10. And there you can see how this piece is. There you go. So, and um, uh, it's not exactly square. So that means I probably didn't lay out my um, piece 100% with uh, the same amount of roving going in every direction. Um, but uh, this, is, this is not a game of perfection. This is a game of making something beautiful, making something artistic, having some fun with it. I mean, you can put glass baubles in these pieces. Um, you know, you can put beautiful locks from sheep. You can do all different kinds of things. You can make cut and sew material. You can do three-dimensional um, pieces. I think um, I do have like, I'm, I, well, I love making heads. <laughs> These, um, I know you're gonna say, how do you do that with the paper? Well, there's a way to do it with the paper. And the nice thing about this is you're not actually just jabbing into the styrofoam. You don't even see a single needle mark. It's really smooth felt. And that's because you're not using a single um, needle to do that. You can use um, fabrics that have, that are already beaded or sequined like this piece here. You can see, um, see how the fabric ends up uh, it has a little bit of a um, texture to it. And that is because the fabric in this case is a cotton and it actually shrunk, but it doesn't eliminate the air. It just shrunk. So it has to shrivel up. Whereas the backside that has the robing on it, um, it is just a solid piece of felt. So there's Are you you know, the, I, the rug. I know the really big piece, the oh. rug that you have. It's so awesome. Okay, I'm so, calling it a rug because it, yeah, that one. It is. It was uh, this here. This actually started out as a five foot by five foot piece, and um, it was felted um, with the art felt method, and that's how we were able to get this beautiful patterning in it. Um, you wouldn't be able to do that with any other method that I know of. And then once we finished the art felt method, so once we had it done like this, we actually put it in the washing machine a couple of times and then it gets shrunk and you can see how nice and thick it is. It's a really super sturdy, um, thick piece. So, um, so that just shows you how thick you can do it. Um, you can do it thick, you can do it thin. Where's our, this is the thinnest piece I have. And it is just wafer thin, as you can see. I mean, it's almost like air and floats down. Um, so this one actually is a silk and merino blend. And people in the last class asked how strong it is. Well, if I pull on it, it's not going to come apart. It's a little bit of you know elastic, but that's because it has the silk in it. I couldn't do this with a pure merino. I mean, it's two sided. It's striped on both sides. And you can also see, you know how I was saying? that your um, material is always going to shrink in the direction the fibers lie the most. Well, that's how we got this little ruffle edge. All these here are going in one direction. So they're shrinking more this way. These are going perpendicular. And so they're going to shrink in that direction. And so what you end up with is a, um, a cute little ruffle. Um, so yeah, my biggest problem is that um, you know, it's one, funny when I teach it stitches, people are always like, she has too many samples. Um, and I do. I'm going <laughs> to. 
sorry, that keeps beeping at me. Um, I get really excited about it because it really is a wonderfully fun technique. Um, we've done bowls out of it and uh, those are really fun too. Um, there's so many different ways that you can use it. And you just gotta, you gotta be a creative person though. <laughs> this is so fun. So, well, we are just over our one hour mark. So Excellent. Karen, thank you. I think this was really fun. I, I hope everyone was and in, is inspired. Um, we will, for those of you who, like I said before, oh, where's my face? I'm just the voice, pay no attention to him. Here I am. Uh, for, for those of you who uh, signed up with our, on a, the class thing through our newsletter, we will send out a follow-up, like I said, uh, with some information about things that we think are useful to uh, give you a good start on this project or projects like this on Artfelt. Um, and for those of you, if people have joined us and were not part of um, the newsletter, um, you can check in our uh, on our blog or sign up for the newsletter and we will let you know because I'm sure we will share our video here. Um, and there'll be links all over that blog of all the things that you need to get so that you can do this. It's so much fun. It's awesome for kids. The most dangerous thing, as Karen mentioned, is that the needle, the little barb and the boiling water. Um, so we can uh, give you information about uh, how to, you know. Just give the kid a wooden spoon so that they use the wooden spoon to um, in their left hand if they're left if they're right handed and then they can use the needle or one of these protective um, type of things that you can get from clover and uh, and then they can um, and they can do, do it something. yeah i mean i i have done it with younger children but you know not much younger than six and they were responsible six-year-olds that listened to me so um but they did have a great time doing it and the pieces that they do are really magnificent yeah. yeah. So this was fun. I know we're going to do more things like this. So uh, please stay tuned for more adventures, maker adventures and things. Um, right. And that's it. So have a wonderful evening, everyone. Thank you for hanging out with us. And, um, and that's it. That's it. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> All right. <laughs>